Hello there. We're in uh, the city of Liverpool today and uh, we're going to look into building that was vital uh, for getting the convoys through from North America and Canada uh, to our country to keep us um, so we can survive in the Second World War. The place is called Davy House or Exchange Flags and was the home of Western Approaches. So come along and have a look at what Western Approaches is all about. So before we get to Western Approaches, uh, I'll give you a bit of history of uh, Liverpool and the Second World War and the um, reason why Western Approaches is here. So beginning the Second World War, 1939, um, Western Approaches was controlled from Plymouth. However, the fall of France in June 1940, um, they had no choice but to move, um, to control the Atlantic convoys up to Liverpool reason why is because um, Germany had control of uh, all of France and they started to build U-boat pens along uh, the um, Atlantic Ocean so <coughs> they moved the uh, the Western approaches from Plymouth up to Liverpool a place called Derby House or Exchange Flags and uh, they devoted all the convoys from the south of England, all around the top end of Ireland, to uh, Liverpool. So on the 7th of February 1941, uh, Western Approaches was established in Derby House in Liverpool, with another control centre in a place called McGee in Derry in Ireland. Number 15 RAF Group, uh, part of Coastal Command, moved into uh, Derby House and uh, I'll do that again. <laughs> Number 15 group of RAF Coastal Command moved in uh, to Derby House and their job was to protect the convoys as much as they could. Now, the Western Approaches is um, defined as a triangular square from the bottom end of Cornwall up past uh, was Orkney and then it also encompasses uh, Ireland as well because that's the west coast of um, our country and we got all our goods from North America and Canada so that's the area with the uh, Atlantic Ocean what we were trying to protect against the U-boats sinking our goods. But the job of the Germans, the U-boats, is to destroy all this to, to take it out of the war. The Germans knew how important this area was so they said to do a bombing campaign over 80 bombing raids on a year uh, from August 1940 to January 1942 um, killing 3,359 people in the Liverpool and Birkenhead area. After the start of Operation Barbarossa by the Germans, the invasion of Russia, June 1941, um, this area of um, England, Liverpool and Scotland started to supply the Russians with um, raw materials, um, armament and goods to keep them in the war. And the main ports there were the, um, the top end of the North Cape in Norway, then to Mimansk and Archangel. Of January 1942 was the last raid that the Luftwaffe did on uh, Liverpool and it destroyed quite a few houses in Upper Stanhope Street and uh, ironically 102 Upper Stanhope Street which was destroyed was the home at one time of uh, Hitler's half-brother. Alos Hitler, I think he's in Alos, I'll put it down anyway, Bob. And it was the birthplace of Adolf Hitler's nephew, which was William Patrick Hitler. Atlantic was the longest campaign that was fought between the Allies and Axis forces. Uh, it started at the beginning of the war in 1939 and ended on the 8th of May 1945. Probably before that, actually, because that, that was VE Day. The battle of the Atlantic cost the Allies a lot of ships, 3,500 ships were sunk uh, mainly by German U-boats, uh, total about 14.5 million tonnes, uh, 175 warships were sunk as well and the, uh, and the Germans lost 783 U-boats. Now if you want to go and see what a U-boat looks like, 
especially if you're in Liverpool, then jump onto Mersey Ferries and nip across to um, Birkenhead. They've got a boat there, a uh, Type 9 submarine called U534. Cut up in sections, but you can walk round it for a small price. You can have a look at uh, uh, what made Winston Churchill so scared in the Second World War. If you want to go and look at a, a complete intact submarine, uh, a Type 7, you have to go to Labor in Germany, and that's a U995. For a small price, again, you can actually walk through the submarine itself and look at it and how the uh, the submariners lived and how they worked the sub. It's quite interesting, actually. But you've got to go to Germany. About the 15th of August, 1945, the Western Approaches uh, was closed down for good. Um, 15th of August is significant to the war. It was the uh, where the Imperial Japanese Army surrendered. Um, after that, they basically the uh, they thought about destroying this place and just knocking it down, but they realised that it would cost too much. The the actual building itself is over seven foot thick in some of the places, so it was just impossible. So what they did was they converted some of the upper above Derby House into um, uh, into offices and. Um, below where the um, bunkers were then it was just left to rot for a good while there was over 100 rooms and there's something like 30,000 square feet now not all of it's open now it's, it's turned into a museum we're going to visit it in a minute uh, because they've got a special event on it's to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the, the VE day 2017 this building started to be restored uh, by a company called Big Heritage which are a, a charity and they plough all the money that you pay to go and have a look at whatever's inside this building back into the building itself to keep up the memories of all the people that fought for us in the Second World War and it also commemorates the, uh, the Atlantic convoys and also the, um, the Arctic convoys that set sail from here um, so we won't forget them This is um, exchange flags now you'll notice that it's in like a if you look at a scan round it's in a U shape. Now, the west, which I think is what the building we're looking at now, was na was called Walker House, named after the uh, famous U-boat hunter killer Johnny Walker. Uh, and the other side of this building is um, Derby House, and that's where you get into the um, the bunker system we'll be going into shortly. If you look on this side of you, which I think it's the east, yeah it is, exchange passage east, I've just noted on the left hand side, you see this thing there, sign there, so I don't worry on, this was called the Hawk House, and this was named after Commander in Chief of the Western Approaches, Admiral Max Horton, and he uh, run the, um, just kind of over here a little bit, he run the um, Western Approaches from November 1942 to 1945. Now, have a quick look at the building itself. Um, we'll dip into the museum, have a look at um, what's in the museum, see what's going on. There's some reenactors here this weekend. We're commemorating the uh, 75th anniversary of the uh, <coughs> VE Day which was the 8th of May 1945. Uh, there's quite a few celebrations going on in the UK at the moment, or there will be, I should say. And um, uh, the uh, Western Approaches Museum is putting one on now. So we'll go in, have a look round, and uh, hopefully I can explain some of the bits and pieces that I can see and what's going on. In the 40s, we had to show our ID and get us and sign it, but now we just walk in and pay the money.
There's going to be a, a reenactment of a um, U boat attack, uh, May 1943, I think it is. So we'll watch that and then I'll, I'll try and interview some of the participants and their roles in this plotting uh, room back in 1940. Ladies and gents, we're now going to take you back to the evening of the 3rd of May 1943. Convoy ONS-5 was on its way from the UK across the Atlantic. This was known as the turning point in the Battle of the Atlantic. So, because this was combined headquarters for Royal Navy Royal Air Force, yeah. um, we have a mix of officers on here. Most of the officers that would be working here would be Lieutenant Commander or above. <laughs> so, my rank is a Lieutenant Commander. So I would be in that operations room handling and dealing with messages coming in, but then passing them to the senior officer in that room right. um, for him to deal with, and then liaising with uh, weather reports, ship reports, aircraft and so on between the RAF. Warship, don't question what you're Uh, I was playing one of the officers in, in, in charge of the map room. Yeah. Obviously, the Admiral is back back in the room at Right. right. Okay. So there will be a senior officer yeah. in charge of the map room, yeah. and it's like shifts. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're conveying up to the girls on the plotting yeah. board. Yeah, I'm the senior officer in charge of the map room. Yeah. I report to the Admiral. The Western approach is a uh, convoy, it's the Atlantic Convoy Control Room. Yeah. You're stood in the map room at the moment, mm -hmm. and my role in that as a, a Women's Royal Naval um, Royal Naval Service, yeah. um, the REMS as it's normally called, yeah. I was a plotter. Right. So my job is to use all the um, Let's call them icons, yeah. if you like. Yeah. So the, all the, the different coloured ships and yeah. things represent the destroyers, the enemy, etc. And my job will be to plot them on the main map, right. so that all the officers can see what is going on at any one moment. Right. Um, so as the messages are coming in, as the weather reports are coming in, yeah. I have to pin all of those items on the board on the yeah. map here, um, so that we can see exactly what's going on, how many enemy have been reported, how yeah. many enemy have been sunk, how many of our own ships have been sunk, what direction they're travelling in. Yeah. All that kind of information is all available on the board itself, so yeah. we can look over it. Yeah. So, if you're plotting all that, who actually looks at that? Is it people up in the gantry over here? Would yes. they plot it, have a look at? Yes. Yes, would right. uh, would Max Orton be up there or something like yes, that? He would. Right. So he would be in the in the top one here. Yeah. That was the officers. Um, uh, room. Yeah, yeah, the room yeah. there. Uh, so well, there's a little desk and stuff in there. So it's worth looking at. But then you'd have a, a whole range of officers here. Yeah. Uh, this is the RN side on the left. Yes. And then the right side is the RAF. Ah, right. Okay. Um, so the RAF would be uh, controlling all of these boards over here. Yeah. Which will be marked where all the planes yeah. are. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we knew exactly where the fleet was and where the aircraft cover was. Right. So. Did you, did you have to do the coordinates of it? Did you know the coordinates, like the map yeah, coordinates? Did you yeah. do them as well, or did somebody say, right, you need to put it in that position? Well, um, my father, who's the officer there, um, he actually did all the research and found out where the coordinates were, yeah. how many ships were in the convoy, at what point they left to refuel, at what point they engaged the enemy. Yeah. So once you've got all the research from, you know, sort of first or second hand yeah, accounts, yeah. you can try and piece together the story and how it all happened. Right. So that's yeah. what we've basically done. Your role in 1940 
in your rank, what would it have been here? It would have been just overseeing what's going on, passing, getting messages from uh, from HQ, from the uh, messages that would come back from the aircraft. Yeah. To HQ. Your your IRAF then, obviously, yeah. And then I would get that message and I would decide what what information needed to be right, and, and what, what, what didn't. So you could basically say, right, squadron such a thing, can you go to such an area? Is that what you would do? Is that how it would work? Yeah, it wouldn't be specific squadrons. Oh, right, yeah. It would be three or four aircraft. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because at this time, it, the aircraft would be, would, they'd be patrolling. And what they'd do is they would send up um, half a dozen aircraft. Yeah. And they would fly in parallel. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, a set route. Yeah. So they'd fly um, an hour in one direction, and then they'd all turn round at the far end and all come back. Right. So they're like sort of scanning so the area. So they'd have they'd have an area. Yeah. That they'd all cover. Um, sixty sixty miles. Yeah. Place, yeah. And they'd just go up and down, up and down. Yeah. <clears throat> until they'd covered that area yeah. and then, then they'd come back to base. They're looking for U-boats I'm yeah. assuming, yeah. So they're basically looking an escort for the uh, for the convoy beside the other escort boats. Looking for the, uh, looking for U-boats on the surface, yeah. uh, looking for signs of U-boats, yeah. looking for uh, uh, U-boats that, uh, uh, that have attacked ships, yeah. getting messages back. Yeah. So, so they're in the air, they can, they're on constant radio contact. With, right, okay. With, 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 uh, Have you any idea when they started to cover the, the dead area? Because there was a dead area at one stage, wasn't yeah, through the wall? Uh, as, as the war progressed and aircraft got um, the ability to fly further for longer, yeah. then, then the, the radius increased. And it was about mid-44 four, mid when, yeah. when they actually finally Might closed. Close that gap. Thing. Yeah. So, I mean, they've got bases on Newfoundland, Greenland, uh, Iceland, and the Azores, as yeah. well as the UK, obviously. Yeah. That, that enabled them to cover the vast majority. Yeah, of the, the whole of the Atlantic Ocean, Ocean really. Ocean. So what was your role in this, uh, if you were actually in this building in 1940? Um, well, in this building, I would assume it's um, taking messages. Yeah. We would get messages from these messages. Yeah. You would write them down and you'd give them to the senior officer. Yeah. He would take them down, pat them onto the plotters, yeah. and the plotters would put them up on the board. Right, okay, yeah. brilliant. That's what so, you would do. So you take the telephone calls, would you I'd get a specific... From a specific area, like for instance, uh, maybe I don't know, um, from either the RAF or one of the ships no, on board. We get ships. Ships. You this get the is, ships. This is main. This is mainly plotting for ships. Right. Okay. This is for the, the approach. So it would all be ship bound. Yes. But the RAF will put in their piece when they were flying. Uh, we're flying if they have a chance to fly then, in, yeah. in, in good weather. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so all this is about the ship. The ships itself. So you're obviously part of the, the navy, point, aren't you? Part of the convoy. Right. Okay. Ladies and gents, the operations room would have been quiet as you can see it in operation now. But what you can feel is the tension building as the reports come in, not only of the multiple U boats gathering, but also the reports now of some of those ships having been attacked and been sunk. Right, we've lost a push ship. Uh, HMS Bing reporting the system Confirmation message from the Royal Canadian Air Force still never continue any further escorts. Also, so far so good. We've only lost one ship. The loss of aircraft cover was a serious concern for the uh, for the convoy, as aircraft were some of the best 
um, weapons against the U-boats and would keep them under the surface with measure they couldn't attack effectively. seen that 13 Allied merchantmen were lost, but seven U-boats were sunk and five U-boats were damaged. That, like for like, could not be sustained by the German Navy. And on the 23rd of May, Admiral Donitz, commander of the German submarine fleet, withdraws all U-boats from the Atlantic. They lost 43% of their total operational strength within the month of May 1943. From this moment on, the Allies begin to win the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, as I said, 13 ships were lost for the loss of 134 Allied lives and 348 German lives. The convoy continued on its way to Halifax and arrived on the 12th of May 1943, having left Liverpool on the 21st of April 1943. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and a round of applause for our reaction. I'm not sure if you heard what uh, the plotting lady said, but this part is, is the um, Navy section where they'd all be standing looking at the plotting map behind me. Max Orton, who was running it, uh, running the show really, was up there looking at the plotting area as well to figure out what to do. And then this was the RAF section there. So the RAF, because they were both combined force of RAF and Navy doing this plotting. Uh, and then if you come over here, see duty station and that up there, the RAF. So in other words, they're just showing you what aircraft uh, would have been probably flying or not flying, what would be damaged. Uh, and then if you look, less of a plotting, can't they see there? Oh yeah, if you look on the plotting area, if the RAF could actually fly and help to um, cover these convoys, to protect this floor, see that's what they're saying. So that's that's uh, Iceland, that's Greenland. And so they were flying in that area. Uh, maybe the weather was better than over here because 
I think at one stage they couldn't fly there because of the bad weather, so they couldn't cover the actual convoys themselves, so they were basically left the wrong with their escorts. So this is the Navy side of things, in the typewriters no doubt they were passing information on, maybe to go to uh, encryption, into the cipher room to pass on to uh, maybe I command, maybe Winston Churchill, who knows. This is the views they were seen through the plotting wall, looking how the things are going. Maybe trying to coordinate things between the uh, Navy and the RAF. So this is the Luftwaffe, which is the uh, German Air Force um, area of Liverpool, where they would try and bomb to sort of stop goods coming and going um, out of here into the rest of the country, and obviously to shop sh ships coming in. So obviously that Red Maria there would have been where the ships are, are basically coming into dock. I can't see. Is that a, what is that, Jack? It's a train line. A train line, is it? And oh, that's a train line, isn't it? So the rear are aiming mainly for that area to try and stop, put the um, put Liverpool out of the out of action. Well, this is the RAF side of things. So they'll be plotting all the uh, upstairs, which is the planes and stuff like that. They'll be in conjunction with, with the navy as well. And uh, they'll they've got a board up there, which I showed you before, where all the uh, the squadron that are and where maybe where they are, and how many is in the squadron, and what they're doing at the time. The uh, hotline telephone, I'm assuming it's straight to Downing Street, something like that, or to um, War Office. Straight to Churchill, maybe. I know Churchill spent some time here. This is Admiral Max Orton's office, who uh, ran this from 42 to 45. There's a little bit of a record in the background, but you can hardly hear it. And more than likely, that's uh, Max Orton's um, jacket. This little cine, well, this big cine projector actually, is um, called a Gamont Cali Dragon projector. Uh, Winston Churchill used to uh, sit in the uh, um, a room wherever it were pointing. If that's the that's the case, or whatever it may be, it might be the plotting room, as we know, or whatever it was, and he watch um, wartime movies. And this is where they get all the uh, messages to re relay to the plotting room of what was happening in the Atlantic regarding the U-boats, convoys, escorts, planes. Well, I hope you like my little um, video on um, Derby House, that video on Western approaches and what it was all about and how vital it was in the Second World War for keeping England, Great Britain, in the war itself uh, as the Duke boats and uh, the Kriegsmarine and all the rest of the Weimacht in Germany trying to destroy some prayers out the war. Hopefully there was some information for you and uh, hopefully I'll see you on the next one. I'll see you again then.